Jeremiah lived during the last 40 years of Judah's history, which culminated in the nation being taken captive. God had sent them warnings through men like Jeremiah. It's just that Jeremiah was living that last 40 years and at the time of uh, the captivity. Here's what he had to deal with. Though there were faithful men, well, he may have been the last one by the time of the captivity, like him, we read in 2 Chronicles 36, 16, but they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. This is about as bad a description as you can find. And as we look at some of the things from the text we're going to look at tonight, you'll see this is not just a, uh, a wild observation. This is precise, and we're going to find many more things like it as we look at this text. The books of Jeremiah and Lamentations proved to be two of the saddest books in the entire Bible, yet ironically, proper consideration for, of them makes for a very rich and rewarding study. Setting the tone for the text on the balm in Gilead, we want to go to Jeremiah chapter 7. And we're going to be looking at most of the end of that chapter and chapter 8. But there are several observations that are made um, even before where we're starting, such as uh, Jeremiah 7, 16. Therefore, do not pray for these people. Can you imagine that? Do not pray for these people. Nor lift up a cry of, or prayer for them, nor make intercession to me, for I will not hear you. That's how dire the situation is. Or verse 26. Yet they did not obey me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. And uh, so this is where we're going to pick up in uh, chapter 7, verse 27. Therefore, you shall speak all these words to them, but they will not obey you. You shall also call to them, but they will not answer you. All of Jeremiah's preaching, therefore, would seem to be an exercise in futility. So why did God want him to preach? Well... The first reason, the foremost reason, is that he needed to make his will known and give his people an opportunity to repent. They needed to have this opportunity. They needed to hear these words. And God would indeed be blameless because he had warned them and warned them many times. A second reason might be that he gave, uh, it gave him the opportunity to reveal his disposition toward the nation's continued stubbornness. A third reason, Jeremiah's numerous warnings served to put all the people under notice that destruction also awaits other nations and individuals who turn their backs on God. God told Jeremiah in chapter 7, verse 28, So you shall say to them, This is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord their God, nor receive correction. Truth has perished and has been cut off out of their mouth. Then a fourth reason for Jeremiah's life's work might be that it serves as a means by which we can measure ourselves. We might ask the question as we look at what it's like at the end of a civilization, how close are we to perishing today? What 
does it look like just before the end? That's what we're going to be seeing. God provides a, the nation a list of complaints from Jeremiah 7, 27 through 34. And we already noted a couple of these uh, verses, but we want to go back and uh, remind ourselves as we go through all of God's complaints. First of all, they would not uh, obey the inspired words of Jeremiah, God's prophet, which we just read. Disobedience to God has always been at the core of man's problems from Adam and Eve onward. In fact, several speakers have mentioned that uh, this week. The world uniting against God at Babel resulted in mankind's languages being changed and the people being scattered to the ends of the earth. Why did the people of Jeremiah's day think they would fare any better in their disobedience and rebellion? If for some reason they did not believe Jeremiah to be inspired, well, what about Moses? They surely knew that Moses had been inspired. Did they know, not know something as fundamental as the prohibition against idolatry, which is one of the Ten Commandments, did they not know that? How could they not know that? Had they not heard, thou shalt not kill? How could that have escaped them? Did they somehow think they could get around the Ten Commandments and not be punished? No, but they are disobedient. The first part of verse 28 again says, so you shall say to them, this is a nation that does not obey the voice of the Lord, their God. Well, regardless of any sin that someone commits, there is a worse offense, and that is their attitude toward it. The second part of verse 28 again, nor receive correction. Refusal to acknowledge wrongdoing is fatal because one must confess sin in order for it to be forgiven, as we've seen this week from 1 John 1, 9. Many are like the adulterous woman who ate and then wiped her mouth and said, I have done no wickedness, Proverbs 30 and verse 20. David was guilty of violating two of the Ten Commandments. And yet, Psalm 51, 17 tells us that he had a broken and contrite heart. That's what made the difference. That's why he remained king. That's why he was forgiven. Yes, he sinned grievously, but he repented of what he did. There is no repentance among God's people at the time of Jeremiah. The people either could not recognize truth when they heard it, or they would not accept it, or both. Notice again from the last part of verse 28, truth has perished and has been cut off from their mouth. Our society is getting to be a lot like that today, don't you think? The people had begun to think that Jeremiah or anyone like him who or who had been like him in recent years was just screwy. In sometimes, in modern times, some will visit our assemblies. Maybe you've had this happen where you are. And uh, they have commented about how strange it is that there's no instrumental music. And some have even made the comments, well, I could never worship in a place where there's no instruments. That's just too weird. Well, undoubtedly, it does seem bizarre if one has been accustomed to it. But the question ought to be, is it right in God's eyes? If God has not authorized it as worship under our covenant, then, you know, we should not try to justify it with weak and lame arguments. Others may know the truth, but just do not care or don't think that truth matters. How many brethren today have bought into the denominational error that grace covers everything 
including evidently false teaching and that you don't need to repent of it. The New Testament refutes such a notion in almost every book. Just a few beware of uh, uh, wolves who come to you in sheep's clothing, Matthew 7, 15, uh, the passage to the elders selling them that of their own selves, some would arise drawing away disciples after themselves, Acts 20, 28 through 30. Uh, if anyone preaches any other gospel than that which been, uh, has been preached, let him be accursed, Galatians 1, 6 through 9. Uh, the uh, encouragement to take heed to yourself and to your doctrine, 1 Timothy 4, 12, uh, trying uh, those who say, uh, who come to you and, you know, uh, you got to try the spirits to see whether they are of God. Jude 3, contending earnestly for the faith. Revelation 22, 18 and 19, about not adding to or taking away from that book. And these are just a small sampling of the warnings that we have. Yet, the erudite among us imagine that they are somehow wiser than holy writ. Error condemns. No one can be saved without a love of the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 10. But returning to the people of the time, they had done evil in God's sight by setting up abominations in the house of the Lord, which resulted in it being polluted. Verse 30. For the children of Judah have done evil in my sight, says the Lord. They have set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to pollute it. Imagine polluting God's house with idols. What an insult to the almighty creator of the heavens and the earth. How could anyone give honor to idols who are nothing. Did they not remember Elijah's contest with the prophets of Baal? How utterly ineffective those men were who worked themselves into a frenzy to the point of cutting themselves, 1 Kings 18. Yet they could not get Baal to produce even a spark over their intended sacrifice, let alone consume their offering because idols are powerless. What could be worse than polluting the sacred temple of the Lord with such riffraff? But number five, how about the killing of their innocent children as sacrifices to these worthless idols? In the valley of the son of Hinnom, they were burning their sons and daughters in the fires and the high places of Tophet. Verse 31. And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart. God never authorized this. God does not approve of this. How could a parent even do such a thing? Had compassion died? Probably they were told something like this, if you sacrifice your child to Molech, he will make you fruitful and prosperous and you'll have many more children. Or maybe it had just become so commonplace in their culture that they just accepted it as many do abortion today. These are the charges of God against his people. Being guilty of any one of these sins would merit destruction, but all of them together call for a massive punishment. So now we want to look at God's reaction. Judah had defiled the temple God's temple he had defiled God's laws and defied them too. He would destroy their place of worship. 
where they sacrificed their children. Verse 32. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when it will no more be called Tophet, or the valley of the son of Hemon, but the valley of slaughter. For they will bury in Tophet until there is no more room. Which occurred when Jerusalem fell. Many would not even be buried. Their uh, corpses would become food for the birds. And uh, we find that in verse 33. Uh, the corpses of this people will be food for the birds and of uh, heaven and for the beasts of the earth. And no one will frighten them away. No more in Jerusalem would there be expressions of happiness, nor the usual joy of accompanying marriages. For the land would be desolate. Verse 34, then I will cause to cease from the cities of Judah and from the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride for the land shall be desolate. The, this gloomy outlook is not mitigated in the slightest. God totally disrespects this generation. Now consider the chilling words of Jeremiah 8 verses 1 through 3. At that time, says the Lord, they shall bring out the bones of the kings of Judah and the bones of its princes and the bones of the priests and the bones of the prophets and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem out of their graves. They shall spread them before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven, which they have loved and which they served and after which they have walked, which they have sought and which they have worshiped. They shall not be gathered nor buried. They shall be like refuse on the face of the earth. Then death shall be chosen rather than life by all the residue of those who remain in all the places where I have driven them, says the Lord. Ordinarily, God did not approve of the desecration of the dead. They were to be treated with respect and honor. But these he called an evil family. We'll come back to chapter 8 in just a minute, but let's back up to Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 31. Jeremiah 5, 31. The prophets prophesy falsely and the priests rule by their own power and my people love to have it so, but what will you do in the end? Yes, this is what they wanted. This is what they chose. They had an alternative, but this is what they approved of and what they wanted. And it encapsulates the character of the people. Is it any wonder that the Lord would take into captivity a generation this smug? The people refused to listen to the inspired word of God. They, did, they would not follow objective truth that they had known for a thousand years. Instead, going to Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 24, they did not obey or incline their ears, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart and went backward and not forward. Does not this describe the, uh, the uh, thinking, the practice of the people in the time of the judges when there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes? Unfortunately, it also describes a lot of society today. Nevertheless, God attempts to reason with his people. Jeremiah 8, 4. Moreover, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, will they fall and not rise? Will one turn away and not return? 
what is the meaning of this passage? Well, the Pope and, uh, pulpit commentary says, whoever sees a fallen man stay quietly on the ground without an attempt to rise. If somebody falls, they, they try to get up. Or a man who has wandered out of the path, does he not come back to the path? Does he just keep walking? Uh, not knowing where he's going to go, going in the wrong direction? Is, is that what you know, a person would do? Well, of course not. That's ridiculous. Yet, Jerusalem is engaged in a perpetual backsliding. They chose to dwell in deceit rather than to walk in the light of truth. Jeremiah 8, 5. Why then has this people slidden back? Jerusalem in a perpetual backsliding. They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. They refuse to repent. God listened for a positive response, but received none. Uh, chapter 8 and verse 6. I listened and heard, but they did not speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into battle. The people did not speak reality. They must have engaged in a tremendous amount of self-deception. The Lord gave animals certain instincts that served them. They migrate, they spawn, they do what God created them to do, but God's people cannot exercise the good sense. He gave a goose. They should know that their sins will bring judgment, but they seem to tune out the message. Verse 7, even the stork in the heavens knows her appointed times, and the turtle dove, the swift, and the uh, swallow uh, observe the time of their coming, but my people do not know the judgment of the Lord. They could not grasp the gravity of the situation they were in despite all of the warnings they were given. Uh, the first part of uh, verse 8. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? What good is it to have God's law if nobody's willing to listen to it or to practice it? If a man had a million dollars placed in his bank account, it would be no good unless he was willing to spend it. Would we not think it was foolish for him to have his car repossessed and his house foreclosed on when he could have taken the money that was in the bank and paid for those things and kept his car and his house? So it is with God's law. They had it, but they failed to benefit from it. They failed to use it. Let's consider the last part of verse 8 and verse 9. Look, the false pen of the scribes certainly works falsehood. The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? God sets the record straight. The scribe is using a false pen to convey falsehoods. And he sets forth lies. If you don't use what you have, if you reject the word of the Lord, what wisdom do you have? What wisdom do you have, American educational system, when you reject the word of God? What wisdom do you have, Supreme Court, when you refuse to consider the principles set forth by Almighty God? When you reject the word of God, what wisdom do you have? And that explains why we're in such a mess in so many ways. But such atrocious behavior brings with it a penalty. Verse 10, therefore I will give their wives to others and their fields to those who inherit them. Because from the least to the greatest, everyone is given to covetousness. From the prophet even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have made people feel better by proclaiming 
that there will be peace when war will occur instead. Verse 11, for they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. And uh, this just continues even worse. Their consciences are so seared that they will practice any evil. Verse 12. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them who fall. In the time of their punishment, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. Their time of punishment is coming. God will consume them, taking away their food and drink and other blessings. Verse 13, I will surely consume them, says the Lord. There shall be no grapes on the vine, no figs on the fig tree. The leaf shall fade and the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. Now, there comes an exchange between God and the people. When things begin to go awry, some of the people will seek to escape seeking fortified cities where they think they will be protected. Now they will think of God, that he is bringing evil on their sins for their sins as he has promised them. Verse 14, why do we sit still? Assemble yourselves and let us enter the fortified cities and let us be silent there for the Lord God has put us to silence and given us the water of gall to drink because we have sinned against the Lord. It begins to dawn on them that the prophets had lied, the false prophets, of course, that the prophets had lied because they looked for peace in vain. Eventually it dawns on them, we're not getting peace. They receive trouble instead of health. Verse 15, we looked for peace, but no good came, and for a time of health, and there was trouble. Babylon destroyed Jerusalem, uh, destroying Jerusalem had been prophesied, and judgment was now upon them. One could uh, hear in God's formerly holy city, the snorting of Babylon's horses all the way from Dan which was in the far north, close to Babylon. Verse 16, the snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones, for they had come and devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those who dwell in it. As Jeremiah envisions the captivity and the punishment, he tries to comfort himself in the sorrow he feels, his heart is faint within him. Here's what he says in verse 18. I would comfort myself in sorrow. My heart is faint within him. But now he experiences torture by what he envisions. From a far country, the daughter of his people will cry out, Is the Lord not in Zion? And a parallelism echoes the thought. Is not her king in her? Chapter or verse 19a. In other words, how could God let this happen? Does he no longer rule? Is he no longer our king? Oh, sure. Now they are willing to acknowledge him. But uh, it's too late. Now they're willing to consider that they had been listening to false deities. But. It's too late. And so God replies in verse 19b. Why have they provoked me to anger with their carved images, with their foreign idols? God's answer to the mournful uh, strains is that they have brought this punishment upon themselves. There, nevertheless, this obsession with idols, they, they wouldn't give them up. 
and they could not protect them. The idols, again, were worthless, as we showed before. And so the people resumed their lament in verse 20. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. The pulpit commentary uh, makes a comment on this, suggesting fruit gathering would be more appropriate than summer, adding when the harvest was over and the fruit gathering ended, the husbandman would look for a quiet time of refreshment. However, that was not going to happen. Metaphorically, they had received their harvest of idolatry, paying a dear price for their sins, and they want to know, why are we not delivered? Now we come to Jeremiah's reaction. One might think, that the constant rejection of Jeremiah's preaching would produce an I told you so attitude. You should have listened to me. You uh, can't expect me to have any sympathy with you now. It's not as though I didn't warn you. But instead, Jeremiah's heart is breaking as he sees what will occur in verse 21. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, I am hurt. I am mourning. Astonishment has taken a hold of me. He knows they deserve it. He's given his life to try and preach uh, and get the point across. They're suffering justly for their sins. They have received plenty of warnings concerning what would happen. But they refused, refused, refused to pay heed to the love God expressed in providing several messages of warning. The prophet cries out, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? On behalf of the people, the balm of Gilead, was prized for its medicinal value, so much so that it was exported to nations around about. Jeremiah has asked if they've run out of the healing substance, as well as a physician to apply it. In other words, is there nothing that can hurt, heal the hurt of the people? Of course, the answer is yes. Gilead still possesses balm, and probably the city did not lack physicians to administer it either. Why is there then no recovery for the health of the daughter of my people? He knows the answer, but he cannot refrain from asking the question. He of all people knows the sins of the nation. He knows Israel is more worthy of all she has received, but he cannot contain his compassion. So chapter 9 verse 1 says, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. The opening of the book of Lamentations continues that thought. Mentioning the loneliness of the now empty city of Jerusalem. The tears she has shed. Her captivity. The prospering of her enemies. Their mocking of her. Considering the, the great ruin of the city and the people. Jeremiah asks, is it nothing to all you who pass by? Behold and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow which has been brought upon me, which the Lord has inflicted in the day of his fierce anger. Lamentations 1 and verse 12. But there was no balm for God's people. There was no remedy for what they had done. Now, Let's take a look at a few applications that we might make from all that we have studied this evening regarding this. First of all, and this point was made a few days ago, 
members of the Lord's church should not discourage preachers and elders. At one point, Jeremiah decided to quit preaching because of the lack of response. In fact, he did, but he could not refrain from proclaiming God's message, which was like a fire burning within him. Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9. Unfortunately, many preachers have succeeded where Jeremiah failed. The fact that a faithful man of God even thought about quitting his life's work shows that no one is immune. Not Jeremiah, not anyone else. Elders likewise have resigned because of uncooperation and discouragement. Hebrews 13, 17 is in the Bible for a reason. They give account of your soul. Don't make it difficult on them. Don't discourage them. Number two, Christians today should make it a primary goal not to disappoint God. Don't discourage leaders. Don't disappoint God. He has commanded us to grow in knowledge and in faith. 1 Peter 2, 2, 3, 18, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, and so on. If we fail to love the church and put it first, we must make Jesus sorrowful. We dare not risk leaving our first love, Revelation 2.4. Growing complacent makes us nauseous to the Lord, Revelation 3.14 through 16. And so may we be a source of joy to him, not a source of disappointment. Three. Especially important is to make sure that we do not disqualify ourselves from salvation as the people in Jeremiah's day did. We, imagine, we might imagine that we are stronger than we really are. We should take heed lest we fall, 1 Corinthians 10:12, 1 Corinthians 9:27. God requires vigilance on our part. We cannot be ignorant of the devil's devices, 2 Corinthians 2:11. This insidious creeping of worldliness spreads through the church also with some objecting to sermons that would deal with modesty or drinking alcoholic beverages. Some preachers have been fired for setting forth the truth on these matters. Some disqualify themselves not only by worldliness, but by false doctrine and believing that which is not true. Also disqualifying Christians from God's favor is their refusal to think and live evangelistically. God provides ways for all Christians to spread the gospel. We are all debtors to all men, Romans 1 and verse 14. Being evangelistic begins with thinking properly. If we had the vision of lost souls, being tortured in the flames as Jesus presents in Luke 16, 19 through 31 with the rich man, we would certainly display the compassion of Jeremiah better than what we are. There was no balm for the sins of the people, but there is for you. There is a balm in Gilead for you, and it is called the blood of Christ. And that blood of Christ can heal the sin sick soul, just as we sang. But you can only contact it if you believe and have repented of your sins, especially from things of a worldly nature, especially uh, from errors that you may have been exposed to. If you will repent of all of the sins that you have committed, confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, then you can contact that blood in baptism. And the blood of Christ will wash away all your sins. And that's even better than the balm in Gilead. 